Welcome to CSIS. My name is Matthew Goodman. I'm Senior Vice President for Economics at CSIS and delighted to welcome you to this uh, public event to discuss uh, supply chain resilience and the role of emerging markets. Uh, we're going to focus in particular on two important economies, uh, India and Vietnam, uh, and by extension, a broader set of emerging uh, economies across uh, Asia and, and the rest of the world. Uh, this is obviously um, an extremely um, hot topic in Washington uh, these days, supply chain resilience, and we're, we're uh, very interested and excited to explore um, a, a relatively unexplored area here in D.C. about the role of India and Vietnam in this story. Um, and, um, you know, obviously this story has been uh, prompted by kind of the, the, the successive waves of U.S. strategic U.S.-China strategic competition, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the war in Ukraine, all of this has raised um, uh, challenges and questions about uh, supply chains. And um, in a sense, uh, countries have started to focus um, on uh, security and resilience um, in addition to efficiency or sometimes in, 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 instead of efficiency um, as the kind of priority for the way they develop their global production and supply chains. Companies as well as governments are focusing on this. Um, and so, um, so there's this new balance between efficiency and security that, that is, um, that is uh, taking over this conversation on supply chains. Um, the Biden administration here in Washington has been very focused on, uh, on this topic, uh, starting with its 100-day review of critical supply chains um, uh, early in its term, um, and then a one-year supply chain of a, a number of important sectors of the economy. Um, but other countries, obviously, the EU, Japan, uh, Korea, others have been very involved in, uh, in uh, this story as well, and we're going to get some perspective uh, uh, from uh, those countries as well. Uh, or some of those countries, um, and um, I think we're we're now um, uh, looking to um, uh, develop this story. Um, we here in the uh, economics program at CSAS issued a report about two months ago, um, looking at uh, the two countries we're focused on today: uh, India and Vietnam, plus Indonesia. And I commend that report to you. It's on our website. Uh, my colleague Matt Reynolds and I uh, wrote that a couple of months ago. And um, we, we found that, you know, all these countries are in one way or another trying to take advantage of this uh, new focus on supply chain resilience and position themselves as, as central to that story. Um, so we have a terrific panel and a second of experts um, to explore this in depth. Um, we're going to start um, with um, my uh, old friend and colleague, uh, Ambassador Mark Knapper, who is the U.S. Ambassador uh, to uh, Vietnam. He's been in that position since February of this year. Uh, prior to that, he had a long, he has had a long and distinguished career um, at the Department of State, uh, working on uh, many um, parts of Asia, uh, particularly Korea um, and Japan. He was the um, uh, charge d'affaires ad interim in Seoul uh, from 2017 to 2018, having served there for a couple of years as Deputy Chief of Mission. Um, he's won various awards, including the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, which is the nation's highest diplomatic honor. Um, and most infuriating uh, to me personally, because I've tried to learn all these languages, uh, Mark is fluent in Korean, Japanese, and Vietnamese, uh, which is uh, unfair. Uh, but uh, really, seriously, um, it's uh, just a pleasure to have Ambassador Knapper with her with us, and um, and I'll turn the floor over to you, Mr. Ambassador. Well, thanks, thanks, Matt, for that really kind introduction. Uh, good morning to you and friends in the U.S. Uh, good evening uh, to uh, friends here in, in East Asia. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, it's been a while since I've done one of these, a little out of practice, uh, but it feels really nice to uh, to be able to join you all. Uh, thank you, Matt, and your team at CIS, CSIS for organizing this program. Um, it's a real privilege to have been asked uh, to speak today about the U.S. effort to build resilient supply chains across our globalized economy and to describe a little bit the work that we're doing uh, present day in, in Vietnam. Um, Matt, as you said, uh, supply chain resilience is indeed a top priority of the Biden-Harris administration, uh, particularly as we grapple not only with the impact of, of COVID-19, uh, but also the fallout from Russia's unprovoked and unjust uh, invasion of Ukraine. Um, like the pandemic, unfortunately, the war is taking a devastating human toll. 
uh, with lives tragically lost, families displaced, and communities destroyed. Um, as we all know, these events have shown just how vulnerable the lines of global commerce can be. Uh, we've seen massive disruptions of, and delays in goods uh, that are driving up prices on everything from automobiles uh, to electronics, from gasoline uh, to food. And the impact of these supply chain shocks has been felt across our economies, our industries. Uh, it's been felt by our workers, by our families, by our communities. Um, of course, many of our supply chains are almost entirely owned and operated by the private sector, but uh, that's not to say that governments can't or shouldn't play a, a key role in identifying supply chain risks and bringing together stakeholders from industry, labor, civil society, and academia to identify and address these critical and, uh, and really significant vulnerabilities. So this is why uh, today and tomorrow, uh, Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of State, our Secretary of Commerce, Raimondo, are co-chairing a supply chain ministerial forum, uh, the goal of which is to bring together governments and key stakeholders. And uh, this forum will look to chart a path forward in addressing short-term bottlenecks, as well as this long-term challenges facing global supply chains. And so our approach, the approach of the Biden-Harris administration is, is focused on several key principles. First, Transparency. Uh, transparency ensures that risks are understood and helps governments, industry, and consumers to respond quickly and accurately in a crisis. Next, uh, the principle of security. Security ensures that supply chains are predictable and that disruptions do not interfere with critical infrastructure or business operations. Next is uh, sustainability. Sustainability ensures that Supply chains reflect our values, and it also helps us to protect the environment, support labor rights, and confront the climate crisis. And finally, the principle of diversification, uh, which ensures that we have multiple sources of goods that can sustain global demand, even, for example, in the event of a natural disaster. So going forward to my remarks today, I'd like to focus on how we are actualizing these principles as we partner uh, with Vietnam to improve global supply chain resilience, uh, where I proudly serve uh, as US ambassador. Uh, just for background, Vietnam is, is the 10th largest trading partner of the United States globally. And as we all know, a key node in supply chains for goods that are vital to the American economy. From semiconductors that power everything from our phones to our cars, to the solar panels that drive the clean energy revolution, as well as our fight against climate change. And our supply chain linkages with Vietnam are not a one-way street. Vietnam imports American-made computer chips, hardwood, cotton, and animal feed, which in turn fuel Vietnam's own production of semiconductors, furniture, apparel, and seafood. And this supports Vietnam's domestic economy as well as exports to markets worldwide. And like virtually uh, every country around the world, Vietnam was devastated by the pandemic. And in fact, just one year ago, um, the Delta variant was peaking here in Vietnam, uh, taking lives, upending livelihoods. Uh, at the time, uh, vaccination rates uh, were still quite low uh, and healthcare capacity here was strained. Um, the streets had gone silent amid very strict lockdowns. In fact, workers were sleeping inside factories, um, trying to keep them going. If in fact, though, uh, they were able to work at all. Today, it's 100% it's different. I mean, life has returned here to normal. Travel has reopened. The economy has rebounded. And uh, really, this is in large measure due to the, the pretty remarkable vaccination campaign undertaken by the Vietnamese government. Uh, today, more than 95% of Vietnamese adults are fully vaccinated. Uh, and a, a remarkable, enviable figure uh, by any measure. And uh, in fact, the US, the United States played a very strong role in this, about which we are, are very proud. Um, to date, we, the United States, have donated nearly 40 million COVID vaccines to Vietnam, as well as more than $33 million in other COVID-related assistance. So by supporting Vietnam's public health response to the pandemic, we were able to help pave the way for a safe reopening of critical manufacturing operations that are so vital to 
uh, economic recovery as well as uh, recovery of global supply chains. But uh, we know that COVID or, or similar, hopefully <laughs> infrequent, rare pandemics uh, won't be the last global health crisis or supply shock that we face. And while it's hard to predict the exact time and nature of the next disruption, we can be absolutely sure that there will be another one. Which is why here in Vietnam, the United States is investing in strengthening this country's role in global supply chains for the long term. And we do this in a number of ways, uh, including by enhancing trade facilitation and private sector competitiveness here, particularly among uh, small and medium sized enterprises, or of course SMEs. Uh, SMEs here form the bedrock of Vietnam's economy, uh, but few of them uh, are actually integrated into global supply chains and they struggle to meet uh, the exacting standards of foreign investors, but also domestic uh, Vietnamese firms. So with programs run by the US Agency for International Development, USAID, um, they, they, they are there helping to address this. Uh, one of these programs is USAID's what's called Linkages for Small and Medium Enterprises or Link SME, which is a five year, uh, $25 million development assistance project which is helping to shape Vietnamese SMEs as they seek to improve their manufacturing capabilities, gain access to finance, and pursue digital transformation. And through this process, the goal is to enable them to better integrate into global supply chains, which we believe will benefit not just Vietnam, but the United States, as well as Vietnam's other trading partners. Uh, as we all know, over the past several years, Vietnam has been among the biggest beneficiaries of supply chain shifts out of China. Uh, but the resulting surge here has strained uh, the country's critical infrastructure and customs operations. And so to overcome this challenge, uh, once again, USAID's uh, trade facilitation program, which is a five year, $21 million effort. Um, this program is working with Vietnam customs uh, to streamline border clearance procedures, as well as reduce congestion to key bottlenecks, including the uh, Cot Lai port in Ho Chi Minh City, which is Vietnam's busiest container operation. Um, earlier, I talked about sustainability as a key principle as we look at supply chains, and um, supply chains can't be resilient if they aren't sustainable, uh, which is why here in Vietnam, we are working uh, to accelerate uh, Vietnam's ongoing clean energy transformation and to reduce its reliance on coal for power generation. So we're partnering with the government of Vietnam to improve energy planning and operations. Um, we're also here working to mobilize private investment in wind and solar power. Um, the United States is funding feasibility studies to expand uh, critical electricity infrastructure. And we're also spearheading innovative technologies like batter, battery energy storage. Uh, we had uh, former Secretary of State and current senior presidential envoy for climate, John Kerry, here in May. And these were all subjects that he took up uh, with his Vietnamese counterparts. And of course, he's got a, a voice here with, with great authority and, and great res uh, respect from the government. And so he's a terrific ally here in Vietnam for us as we work with, with the government to uh, on, on its clean energy transition. Um, to that end, we're also working with the government to promote a uh, innovative policy mechanism uh, called the Direct Power Purchase Agreement or DPPA, which uh, will allow businesses to purchase electricity directly from renewable energy producers. So with this policy, it will help both to decarbonize supply chains here, but also create new investment opportunities for manufacturers looking for renewable energy to power their operations. And so we believe uh, that together, all of these efforts will help Vietnam transition to a clean energy and climate resilient future. So these are just a few of the ways here in Vietnam that we are seeking to strengthen uh, this country's role in global supply chains. Um, but of course, the US government is not alone in this effort. Uh, and here, there is no better partner in promoting supply chain resilience than the American business community. Um, US firms have invested billions here, integrating Vietnam into global supply chains that are diverse, secure, and sustainable, that are free from forced labor, supporting the dignity of workers, and are also in line with our climate goals. So I'll wrap up here. I'm sure folks want to hear what our panelists have to say. I know I do. Uh, but in closing, I'd like to underscore that neither the US nor Vietnam nor any country can manufacture or supply every item it needs. Uh, we live in an interconnected world. 
and collaboration with Vietnam and other partners is absolutely critical to enhancing uh, the resilience of global supply chains as well as promoting our prosperity. So thank you very much again, CSIS. Uh, we look forward to hearing uh, more from everyone and uh, hopefully we can we can find new ways together to increase our resilience and uh, for our part here in Vietnam to promote a Vietnam that is strong, prosperous and independent. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. That's a terrific um, uh, introduction to this uh, important issue, and you've given us a lot of uh, a sort of broad framing of, of how we are approaching this issue of supply chain resilience in Vietnam, but also some some interesting details that we can hopefully follow up on. If, if you're willing to indulge uh, one or two brief questions, I, I know you have to uh, get on to other things, but I, I uh, would like to ask one or two if I could. Um, and uh, one of those is, um, you know, when you talk to your Vietnamese counterparts, you know, which of these things that you've talked about are resonate most of them? I mean, is this something, are these things that really uh, Vietnam is is looking for, um, you know, uh, particularly looking for U.S. Uh, solutions and, um, you know, and, and engagement? Uh, where, where would you highlight, you know, particularly their interests um, here in these issues? Well, thanks. That's a great question. I think, um, I mean, small and medium-sized enterprises, in many ways, are the backbone of, of the economy here. They uh, generate a lot of employment, and I think uh, you know the Vietnamese government is quite interested in in ensuring that these these SMEs have the ability to um, produce the kind of goods not only important for domestic uh, manufacturers here, but also that can that can join global supply chains that can. Um, you know, be uh, be be world beating in their in their own fashion, and so um, absolutely SMEs are, are key, um, and also energy transition. I mean, Prime Minister Ching in Glasgow last year uh, at COP26 um, announced that Vietnam would be uh, sort of you know car carbon free by 2050. A really bold, uh, courageous proclamation, and um, this is something that that we in the United States, but not just us. I mean, the international community. Um, you know, including the G7, including um, MDBs and international finance organizations, we're all sort of behind Vietnam on this because this really is essential to to Vietnam's future is having a, a carbon free uh, country by 2050. And so um, obviously a lot of high level and really important conversations going on in that space as well. Right. OK, um, that's helpful. Just um, one uh, question that's come in from the audience is one that I was also um, um, interested in uh, myself, which is how are you working with your counterparts uh, from other U.S. allies that are um, active in, in Vietnam? So, you know, you're very familiar with Korea and Japan. And I assume you interact with your counterparts from those countries. You know, in what ways are you are you working with them on these issues? Oh, thanks. I mean, another quick question. I mean, this is something that um, I uh, just given my own background and experience, I've I've worked pretty hard over the last six months to try and to try and focus on is yes, how do we how do we work with uh, Tokyo and Seoul and others, uh, our friends in the EU, the UK, Australia? Um, you know, how can we better coordinate our activities, not just government to government, but also among the private sector? And so, without giving giving away any details, we've got you know large American firms working with Japanese partners on potential um, energy projects. We've got uh, our own USAID working with uh, organizations like JICA, like COICA, um, you know, just because it's the smart thing to do, but also, frankly, you know, all of us have limited resources and just to avoid redundancy and overlap, it's, uh, it makes sense for our governments to, to evaluate how well we're, we're doing and coordinating. And so both government to government, but also business to business, um, I think we're, we all realize that we, we do better if we can, we can coordinate and collaborate more effectively. Okay, great. Well, and that's another um, set of issues that we're going to try to explore a little bit in our panel. We have a, a an official from Tokyo who will give us some perspective on 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 those uh, efforts by Japan, and uh, and then we'll uh, hopefully continue this conversation um, well beyond that. We definitely will uh, here in uh, at CSIS uh, going forward. But um, Ambassador Napper, thank you so much for your time, for your insights, and for getting us off to a great start uh, in this event today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, everybody. OK, thank you. And now I'm going to uh, turn uh, without any um, any real transition or intermission uh, to our distinguished panel. We have a terrific group of four um, experts who can help us um, flesh out some of these issues 
that we that the ambassador just already talked about. Um, and I'm going to introduce them in turn and then um, ask them each of uh, an initial question to ask them to to uh, make some some opening comments and then we'll have a bit of a discussion here. And then after that, um, the last 10 or 15 minutes, um, I will uh, take audience questions. If you have a question, there should be a button on your screen that you can use to um, to submit a question. Um, and we will try to get to uh, at least a few of those uh, before we end the uh, the program here today. Um, so the the first um, uh, speaker on our panel is um, Alex. Tatsis, who is Economic Section Chief at the U.S. Consulate General in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, uh, Alex is a long-serving um, Foreign Service Officer who served in multiple posts around uh, Asia and the rest of the world. Um, he uh, also worked in finance in New York. Um, he holds a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University. Delighted to have you with us, um, Alex. Um, then we have Dr. Vo Thi Thuy An, who is Associate Professor and a lecturer in finance at the University of Economics, University of Da Nang, uh, where she's been since 1996. Uh, Dr. Vo received her master's degree in financial economics um, in 2003 and her PhD in economics uh, in 2007 from the University of Quebec in Montreal, Canada. Um, she also was a, a visiting Fulbright scholar at the University of Michigan in 2014-15, um, and she's widely published on um, a, an array of issues, uh, corporate finance, crisis, risk-taking, uh, gender diversity. Uh, so um, we're just delighted to have uh, Dr. Vo with us today. Um, third is uh, Dhruva J. Shankar, who is executive director of the Observer Research Foundation here in uh, America, uh, based here in DC. Um, uh, Druva has been um, in, uh, in the think tank circuit for a long time, uh, serving with the, the Observer Research Foundation in Delhi, but also um, he's affiliated with Lowy Institute in Sydney. Um, he uh, worked at the Brookings Institution at the German Marshall Fund, um, and he's also widely published on India's relations with the United States, Japan, Australia, Southeast Asia. So he's going to uh, be a terrific addition as well to our conversation here in a minute. Um, and last but not least is Noriyoshi Fukuoka. Um, Fukuoka-san currently serves as Director for Supply Chain Resilience at, in the Trade Policy Bureau at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry um, in Tokyo, or METI, as it's uh, better known. Um, he was previously the Director of the Southwest Asia Office, which I think includes India, um, uh, since 2020. And he has served in Thailand as well, so he has um, a lot of uh, regional uh, perspective um, from his uh, work and, and his uh, postings. Um, he has an MA in International Development Economics from Yale University, as well as a Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Tokyo. So delighted to have Fukuoka-san with us as well. Um, but let me start with Alex. Um, Alex, you're um, on the ground there in Ho Chi Minh City um, in uh, southern Vietnam. Um, Building on the ambassador's um, presentation, can you give us a sort of ground eye level view of, of, of what supply chain resilience means uh, there, what kind of specific uh, work you're doing on the ground there uh, with your Vietnamese counterparts with U.S. business and, and so forth? Uh, please go ahead, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, having served here over the past two years of the pandemic, uh, I think it, it showed us just how important Vietnam is in global supply chains for a broad range of consumer and industrial goods, including goods that are really critical to the U.S. economy. Uh, last fall, for example, we saw how disruptions to semiconductor factories here in Dong Nai province and Binyung province caused slowdowns of U.S. auto plants in Michigan and Ohio. Uh, Vietnam is home to half of Samsung's global smartphone production and half of Nike's footwear production. So what happens here has a, has a really major impact on global industry and consumers. And I think from our perspective, it's it's not hard to see why Vietnam has been such a magnet for FDI in manufacturing, particularly as companies look to diversify away from China. It has a strategic location, a relatively low cost workforce, stable government, generally favorable macro outlook, welcome approach to export oriented FDI and a broad network of free trade agreements. And it also it also has a domestic market of 100 million people with a growing middle class. So I think there's very few countries in the world that can match all of that. So the opportunities we see to strengthen Vietnam's role in global supply chains are quite significant. But there are challenges too. And I'd like to build on what the ambassador said briefly and just discussing some of those challenges and how we are 
working with Vietnam to address them. Uh, three quick points I'd like to focus on. First, uh, backward linkages in supply chains. One of the vulnerabilities we see uh, in Vietnam's industrial base is how reliant it is on imported intermediate goods, particularly from China. And that, that's true across many uh, key export sectors. So in textiles and apparel, for example, Vietnam re relies heavily both on imported cotton, including from the United States, it's one of our largest exports here, as well as fabric uh, from China, Taiwan, Korea. Uh, the solar panel industry here is quite significant, but it's heavily reliant on imports from China, including imports that are at risk of being tainted by forced labor in Xinjiang. So deep reliance on inputs from abroad is is also true in semiconductor and other microelectronics production, machinery, and a, ho a host of other sectors. So that, that poses risks uh, as continuing COVID-related disruptions in China can really affect input pricing and availability for Vietnamese companies in unpredictable ways. Um, and that's where uh, the USA Link SME program that the ambassador mentioned comes in. Uh, we're really, we're working very directly with SMEs uh, to connect them with lead foreign investors and big domestic firms to help increase their capabilities and deepen their participation in global supply chains. Uh, secondly, I'd like to just briefly touch on infrastructure constraints. Um, as the ambassador mentioned, the supply chain shift from China has really pushed some of Vietnam's infrastructure to the brink, particularly here in the South, which accounts for roughly 70% of Vietnam's seaborne trade. Um, you know, at that you know, as consumer demand was really surging in the U.S., the number of weekly direct vessel services from Kaimet Port uh, there were to the U.S. West Coast, East Coast, and Gulf Coast was as many as 26 container vessels a week uh, from Vietnam to the U.S., which just shows you the volumes we're dealing with. Um, and so infrastructure is very quickly becoming a bottleneck. Uh, and when we talk about Vietnam vis-a-vis -vis China, just want to put this into a little context. Uh, the gap between China's infrastructure and Vietnam's is, is quite enormous. Um, when you look at port volumes pre-pandemic, uh, a 5% drop in port volumes in China would be equivalent to a 70% increase in Vietnam. Uh, the port of Shanghai alone is roughly three times the volume of all of Viet Vietnam's ports combined. So there's a huge, huge challenge to overcome there. And we are working, uh, as the ambassador noted, to help with trade facilitation, to decongest ports. And we're doing even more to create an enabling environment for infrastructure investment by supporting the Vietnamese government to strengthen its public-private partnership law and framework to help mobilize private investment in critical infrastructure. And the last point I'd like to make is about moving up the value chain, uh, specifically workforce development. Because while Vietnam is currently enjoying great success in attracting FDI and manufacturing, uh, you know, a lot of it is a, among lower value added activities like assembly, whether it's in semiconductors or smartphones, solar panels or batteries. And that's that is a really critical step because assembly is the last uh, step before um, goods are shipped off to consumers. But how long Vietnam can stay competitive in those lower end sectors over the long term is not clear. So for Vietnam to reach its full potential and realize its aspirations of becoming a high income high-tech knowledge-based economy, we think workforce development is really critical. And in partnership with U.S. universities and the private sector, we're working uh, with the Vietnamese government to help modernize the education sector so it can produce the graduates needed to move into higher value-added activities that will help really strengthen and secure its role in global supply chains for uh, years to come. Thank you very much. Super. That's really uh, helpful and very clear. Um points and I want to follow up on on all of that and and have a couple of uh, questions myself um, on, on that but let me um, go through um, the other experts so that we get a, a full um, picture here and then we'll come back and do questions so let me turn to dr Vo, dr Vo next and let me ask you um, how well do you think Vietnam is positioned uh, to take advantage of this new focus on supply chain resilience. What are, in your perspective, from your perspective, what are Vietnam's real strengths? What are its challenges um, and issues that it needs to work on if it really wants to be part of this supply chain resilience story? Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Dr. Mopo. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you so much for having me in this panel uh, discussion. As mentioned in the, the speech of the two other uh, speakers, 
uh, advanced economies now are looking for emerging economies as alternatives to China in terms of supply chain uh, for um, several reasons. First, they want to be more autonomy and to avoid the dependence on the Chinese economy. Second, they want to promote mutual economic security and enhance international economic rules and norms. And the final reason um, is that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has um, accelerated supply chain restructuring. Therefore, supply chain resilience uh, has become one of priority policies of the United States uh, and its uh, allies. Uh, so it is expected to have a shift of some, some or all of the firm's production out of the mainland. Being in the, uh, in the proximity of China with low labor costs, open investment law, friendly environment, uh, and a population of uh, 1 million people, and um, very um, a high growth uh, rate in the Indo-Pacific region. Vietnam is a potential destination for this. However, uh, as you know that, uh, and uh, as mentioned, um, as Alex just mentioned, uh, the, the decision on investment of the multinational corporation uh, are made based on a lot of factors. First one is cost advantage, which is the main reason that turned China into the worst factory. Second, they uh, always prefer a country with better institutional environment and a country with a high level um, of labor skill. And they also uh, want to um, invest in a, a good, uh, in, uh, in a country with good infrastructure. Uh, however, um, uh, although uh, Vietnam, uh, the labor cost in Vietnam now is rather low, but it is uh, increasing uh, along with living costs and waste. And, uh, uh, and also, Vietnam is lack of qualified labor. Uh, therefore, there may be low value active produ production moving to Vietnam rather than high technology uh, production. There is also a competition among uh, countries around, uh, such as Thailand, Indonesia, um, India, for example, we all want to benefit uh, the production shift from the mainland. And um, you know that Vietnam and the other countries in uh, the neighborhood uh, share a common uh, characteristic, but the other countries may have a better infrastructure, more skilled labor. And also Vietnam's production depends strongly on raw materials imported, especially from China. There are also other problems that subject weak domestic production uh, capacity, uh, limited sporting industry, and the dependence of Vietnam on foreign shipping, which make Vietnam less attractive for foreign investors. And all the, uh, the problems were more pronounced during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, therefore, the Vietnamese government has implemented uh, a lot of policy to attract this investment flow and to increase the trade with US, European countries and other advanced economies. For example, Vietnam just um, updated uh, law on investment and in the new version, the law provides more incentive to foreign investors and easier investment flow from uh, offshore companies. Vietnam also identifies some priorities uh, sector such as um, high technology uh, sector, innovative style uh, research and development center for example. And uh, it has also continued to improve infrastructure, reduce administration costs and enhance public services. Besides that, Vietnam has drawn 15 bilateral or multilateral uh, free trade agreement including the trans Pacific uh, Partnership TPP in the 2016, um, or uh, we joined the EU Vietnam uh, Free Trade Agreement, which entered in, uh, into force in 2020. Uh, we also joined the Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership, which is the, uh, the multi multilateral trade agreement of uh, 15 ICE. Asia Pacific nations, including China, we came into effect at the beginning of this year. Vietnam also shown um, the Indo Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity IPEF. Of course, it, uh, it is not a trade agreement.
However, uh, IPEF aims at cooperation for benefit of people. This uh, framework creates a free, open, sustainable, and inclusive space for development, creating condition, uh, condition and opportunities for all countries to promote the cooperation. And uh, with the IPEF, we expect to um, have a more export to uh, the U.S. market. And the frameworks also uh, strengthens the U.S.-Vietnam relationship as trusted partners, which creates a favorable environment for investment flow and trade between the two countries. And with the, the uh, policy and the FTA, uh, the, the, the international trade of Vietnam increased uh, significantly and we attract more and more uh, foreign investment. In details, in terms of trade and economic uh, cooperation, the U.S.-Vietnam uh, bilateral trade has grown from uh, 451 uh, million dollar in 1995 to over 90 uh, billion in um, 2020, and uh, it jumped to uh, more than 114 billion in 2021. And Vietnam uh, uh, currently is the ninth largest wood trading partners of the U.S. of five places from uh, the 2020. And uh, why Vietnam is the largest export market, the China is the biggest import market in Vietnam, and the U.S. is now the 11th biggest foreign investor in Vietnam, uh, with about 10 billion uh, U.S. dollar investment uh, in um, in the list. Uh, uh, Singapore um, is the, the first one, uh, and then South Korea, uh, Japan, China, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, and um, the other countries. So um, from the picture, we can see that Vietnam is always welcome coming American partners. And uh, as a developing country, middle income nation, to be specific, we are welcome to all the, uh, the opportunities to grow as long as uh, it is uh, consistent with the law and have uh, no political, social, environmental problems. And as we often say, we want to have a fewer enemies and more friends. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bo. Excellent um, uh, presentation. Very complimentary, I think, to Alex's and, but adding some new elements that, again, I would like to follow up on um, after we hear from our other panelists. So, uh, but so let me um, turn to Dhruva and and to India, um, which is also an important player in this story. And and just to ask this way, Dhruva, I mean, everyone seems very solicitous of India these days. I, I noticed last month that there was a week in which India was invited to the BRICS meeting at the beginning of the week and to the G7 meeting at the end of the week. Um, and we're also working with, with India bilaterally and through the Quad and Japan's working in with India. Um, it, it, it seems that there's a lot of interest in, in India in, in general, uh, but in, in the context of, of um, engagement on, on supply chain resilience in particular. So can you talk about sort of how you, you think Delhi sees all of that and, and what its interest is in, in um, engaging on those issues? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. I hope you can hear me. And thanks to CSIS. Uh, I really appreciate also the comments on uh, Vietnam. I learned a lot about uh, uh, how, it, how, how these developments are being seen in, in Vietnam. And actually, uh, the law of similarities, I think, uh, a lot of the presentations we've heard, I think, could, could transpose themselves very easily onto an Indian context. Um, you know, I think we are. Uh, I, I come at this uh, from a from a security and foreign policy point of view, not from a trade uh, or economic point of view. But I think for people like us, uh, the supply chain resilience is now an at or near the top of our list of things that we worry about. And this has largely been because of of what I see as three major shocks that we've experienced in the past uh, few years. Uh, the first uh, being, I think, the the U.S.-China trade war that was uh, initiated during the Trump administration, um, and uh, which is, still has uh, lingering effects, uh, and it affected not just the United States and China, but but a lot of other countries as well, directly and indirectly. Uh, the second, even bigger shock was, of course, coronavirus. And uh, again, rather than being restricted to 2020, 2021, China's zero COVID policy has actually extended the, the, the implications of that well into 2022 and perhaps beyond. 
And then the third big shock, of course, was the Russia-Ukraine war. And, uh, you know, it's affected the world in, in unforeseen ways, including on uh, food, fertilizer, um, uh, it, it thinks that both Russia and Ukraine uh, were large producers of critical minerals, um, uh, defense supplies, energy supplies, and so forth. Um, so I think a combination of these things has really focused policymakers' attentions in India and, and elsewhere on this issue of resilient supply chains. Um, and suddenly this, you know, the, the, the new mantra has been like moving from just-in-time production to just-in-case production. Um, the, in India, it's, it's reinforced what was already, uh, at least in this government and, and I think in preceding governments too, uh, a sense of uh, the importance of self-reliance and the, the, the term used as Atmanir Bharat, as of self-reliant India. Um, this, uh, um, uh, this slogan, however, I think is interpreted very differently, uh, even within the Indian government. And so there isn't a sort of one view of what, what does a self-reliant India actually mean? In what areas should it be self-reliant? Can it be self-reliant in every area? Uh, some have translated it uh, very uh, crudely, I think, as a sort of a, a reversion to autarky. But I think a more enlightened and more realistic view of uh, what a self-reliant India uh, should be or, or looks like is one where it, essentially it can work with trusted partners in the global uh, international trading system. Um, to, so a version in some ways of what uh, others have referred to as French shoring. Um, uh, I should also say, I think as background, that the Indian model of economic development and the growth we've seen over the last two, three decades looks very different from other parts of East Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, which is the broadly the model. India did not quite or has not quite followed the model that uh, Japan, the Asian tigers, uh, mainland China and others uh, adopted over the past half century or so, uh, starting at low end uh, manufacturing a large-scale employment, export-driven um, uh, some model of growth and development and moving up the value chain. Uh, instead, India's growth model has actually been, in some ways, a bit more of a hybrid with what we've seen in the West. So uh, very consumer-driven, India has the third largest uh, current account deficit of any country after the United States and UK. Um, and, and also very services-driven, um, so sometimes at the expense of of manufacturing. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, India, despite being a large trader, and actually India has a higher trade to GDP ratio than many, than Japan, than, than China, than many other major economies, um, this has largely been uh, driven by imports uh, and particularly in raw materials. Uh, India is, is quite resource starved uh, and one third of its imports are actually just five commodities, oil, gas, coal, gold, and, and uh, diamonds. Um, but the, uh, you know, India hasn't actually been so far very well integrated into global value chains, despite this high, uh, relatively high trade volume and particularly import uh, volume. Uh, there are a few exceptions to this. Uh, we've seen in pharmaceuticals, India is now a major producer, particularly of generic pharmaceuticals, and is uh, very well integrated into uh, those supply chains. And we've seen this come to the fore during the COVID pandemic. Uh, another area of some partial success has been in auto parts. Uh, India is now a major exporter of auto, auto parts. Uh, other areas actually um, where it has done reasonably well, but is actually lagging sometimes relative to competitors, has been in uh, textiles. Um, India faces stiff competition from China, Bangladesh, Turkey, and other places. Uh, but but you know these have been exceptions rather than the rule. Um, in again, in response to the shocks that I mentioned, there has been a, a renewed uh, attempt. Uh, at uh, incentivizing manufacturing. Uh, and this has shown some success now in the past year or two, although it's still early days, in electronics manufacturing particularly. And you're seeing an uptick in Indian exports. So the assembly of uh, electronic hardware, including smartphones, uh, and the export to uh, markets, particularly in the developing world. And that seems to be one area that has, just in the past year or two, emerged as one area of partial success. Um, and uh, this has been due in part to what is what's called a production-linked incentive, uh, which is a, a sort of a scheme, a, sort of a government scheme to incentivize manufacturing in this area. Uh, this is now uh, attempts are being made to replicate this in other sectors, um, in, in green energy, for example, and in other areas. But again, we're very early days yet. Um, finally, I'll just, uh, I think uh, I should address what uh, some of the major challenges are. Uh, so my organization, Order of America, and along with our partners in India, have been uh, surveying and uh, in, a, in a series of discussions with uh, manufacturers, both Indian-based manufacturers and multinational uh, manufacturers who are interested or have a presence in India. 
And uh, some of the challenges that they face uh, currently uh, sound actually very similar to what we hear about Vietnam, but I would say the top ones are sometimes uh, local content requirements or high tariffs uh, for imports, uh, imported goods, uh, and that makes it very uh, uh, difficult for manufacturers in India to get access to intermediary goods, sometimes they are necessary for production, um, and sometimes the local content requirements make it impossible. So that, sir, unfortunately, uh, while well-intentioned and I think sometimes designed to uh, to uh, bring uh, for onshoring, uh, actually uh, tend to, tends to deter uh, uh, investment in, in an integration of India into supply chains. Uh, a second major challenge, and this is a long-standing one, has been regulatory uncertainty, uh, and uh, this means sort of uh, both the central, the, the federal government, and the state government sometimes are not harmonized. Uh, some are more competitive, some states are more competitive than others, and CSIS under Rick Rosso is doing incredible work on on uh, mapping that. Um, but uh, sometimes, uh, overall, there is a sense that uh, long-term investment in India is sometimes uh, deterred by by what they see as uh, by by what investors see as a sort of fickle uh, environment, and so uh, renewing that sense of trust in uh, investing in India, I think, is a long term challenge for and and will be a long term challenge for successive Indian governments. Um, finally, I think there are just a, a number of ease of doing business related issues that that they have that uh, investors have to grapple with uh, in India. Uh, some of it has to do with logistics. Uh, the time it takes for a ship to clear an Indian port is on average about four times as uh, long as it takes to clear a port in China. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just one example of some of the logistical challenges that remain, although infrastructure uh, spending and execution has actually improved uh, quite significantly uh, in parts around the country. But there are other challenges uh, related to human capital, uh, to, to land acquisition, to, to other elements, uh, regula basic regulatory hurdles um, that uh, need to be, to be cleared. So a combination of these things I think are, are still challenges that India will face uh, as it faces competition for uh, diversified supply chains from Vietnam, from Thailand, Indonesia, Mexico, Philippines, and uh, East Africa, other uh, Bangladesh. Um, so I think that this is the sort of uh, a snapshot of the world I think we're, we're uh, living in. A uh, final point I would say is that um, there's some um, uh, room for, uh, for for optimism, I think. Uh, and one sign of that is India's uh, renewed uh, uh, signing of a uh, uh, commitment to free trade agreements. Uh, India has signed one with Australia recently, uh, one with the UAE, which is one of its largest trade partners and is a major transshipment hub. Um, there are uh, these renewed negotiations underway with the UK, uh, with the European Union, uh, with Canada and Israel. Um, and uh, so, so that's on, on one side. And also India has uh, joined IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, that has been driven by the Biden administration, uh, along with uh, Vietnam, uh, with six other uh, ASEAN countries, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand. Um, so, uh, uh, and one of those pillars, of course, of IPEF is on supply chain resilience. So uh, I think we'll be in for some negotiations in the next two years, um, and uh, hopefully there will be something to show at the end of that time in terms of um, uh, so concrete agreements related to supply chain resilience and uh, India's integration with uh, like-minded and friendly partners. Okay, excellent. Again, really clear, crisp, and and um, an insightful um, presentation of of the sort of Indian uh, a part of this story. I really appreciate that, Dhruva. And I have some questions, including um, uh, I want to come back to IPEF um, in a, in a second um, uh, with with all the presenters. In fact. Um, but uh, but let me first um, let us first hear from Fukuoka San. Um, so Japan has been very active in in these two countries and more broadly in in the rest of Asia for many years as an investor as a trader, and um, and in from a diplomatic perspective, I know that um, Southeast Asia and South Asia have been real priorities for the for the government in Tokyo through several administrations. So. Um, this story about supply chain resilience is also something that you've been very focused on, um, and I'd be interested uh, in hearing from you, Fukuoka-san, about kind of how you're channeling those efforts. What specifically, how do you see the supply chain challenge in, in these countries, and, and what is Japan uh, engaging to do on this issue? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Matthews, and thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, thank you for uh, CS, CSIS, and uh, distin distinguished professionals. Today, I would like to introduce the cooperation of the Japanese government with India and ASEAN in the area of supply chain resilience. I hope you will find it useful. 
on the uh, next page. And as you know, supply chains are interconnected across borders and international cooperation is essential for resilience. And the cause of supply chain disruptions are diversifying. Natural risks include pandemics, of course, uh, COVID-19, and uh, earthquakes, floods, and climate change. While economic risks include concentration of suppliers, and uh, energy price hikes. More recently, human rights are also a factor in supply chain disruption. And the, these are three major measures to address supply chain disruption factors. The first is to make supply chain more visible. And the second is to diversify suppliers and the third is the uh, trade facilitation, such as uh, improving custom clearance procedures. And the first, first is the visualization of uh, the supply chain, which is useful in normal occasion to improve the productivity of supply chain. And in emergency, it is also useful useful for predicting supply chain disruptions and speeding up recovery after disruptions. Furthermore, it is it might give the solution to visualize carbon footprint and human rights. And this page introduces introduces the supply chain resilience initiative, which is being implemented in Australia and India and Japan. The purpose of the uh, supply chain resilience initiative is creating a budget cycle of enhancing supply chain resilience and attaining strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth in the in the Pacific region through cooperation among Australia, India, and Japan. And the uh, uh, reaction is a. Uh, pro, uh, uh, make launching a uh, collaboration project conducted by trilaterally for supply chain resilience and the uh, project conducted by each government for, for supply chain resilience. And uh, we are now uh, collaboratively working with the uh, investment organization, uh, General Investment India and Australia uh, to, to, to make a matching event and to uh, uh, collaboration on the business sector. And we are now seeking to make supply chain principle, uh, supply chain principles formulation. And I would also like to introduce the supply chain principles being discussed in the three countries. Uh, basically, uh, I think it is important to include the concept of trust while basic uh, basing it on the U.S. chairman's statement. Actually, uh, 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 yeah, present our idea is in line with the U.S. U.S. chair statement on their uh, uh, sub summit on global supply chain resilience, and uh, we will also focusing on the trust. Trust is, uh, uh, I think, is a very important element of the principle. And uh, many forums discuss the uh, pillars of the uh, uh, principle. Uh, as uh, uh, His Excellency and Ambassador Maxon mentioned about the pillars in the uh, IPF, uh, they mentioned uh, uh, sorry uh, in the IPF um, they mentioned transparency, diversify, security, sustainability. And in the quad, they mentioned transparency and security. And that kind of the principle is very important to make the uh, uh, collaborating a collaborative project. And uh, uh, I would like I would also like to introduce a uh, 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 introduce specific government uh, support based on the Sukuri Supply Chain Resilience Initiative. Uh, Japan has uh, commenced programs 
for the supplies of resilience in the in the Pacific region in fiscal year to 2020 to 2023 to promote supply chain resilience of Japanese global companies through a supply chain visualization with 8.6 million US dollars. And uh, this includes uh, this uh, program includes uh, six project in, projects in India and three projects in Australia and four projects in Southwest Asia out of to eight to total project. And uh, I, Japan has also offered the uh, support program for the diversification of overseas supply chain. And uh, this is uh, Vietnam is the uh, biggest user in the uh, Southeast Asia for this uh, supporting program. Uh, this uh, Japan uh, companies uh, since uh, with around 300 million US dollars mainly in a sense. And uh, um, And uh, I introduce a case study of Shobadenko here. Shobadenko uses uh, silica filler uh, produced in India as a material and process, processes it in Malaysia and supplies parts to US semiconductor manufacturer, manufacturers. The company is considering visualizing this supply chain to enhance its response to geopolitical and environmental risks the Japanese government supported the upgrading of this supply chain resilience. And finally, uh, Japanese government is con contributing 300 million US dollars for supply chain uh, diversification, including Vietnam. And these are our collaboration among India, uh, Australia, and ASEAN, and Japan. And so, oh, oh, Utilize, by utilizing these measures, we are now uh, promoting uh, our upgrading our supply chains, uh, upgrading supply chains and make our supply chain more resilient. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Fukuoka-san. Very rich presentation again. And um, you've touched on some issues that I um, want to follow up on really with all the, all the, um, presenters. And um, I've got so many questions, it's difficult to, uh, to to sort through them. But but let me say to the audience um, as well that we still welcome your questions. Um, if you send them through that button on your screen, um, we'll, um, we'll try to get to, to some of those questions after I ask a couple of my own. Um, I guess I, I want to ask everybody, um, and maybe we can go backwards um, from Fukuoka-san, um, back through the other panelists. You know, this story is something that governments are very focused on here in Washington, in Tokyo, in Delhi, and in Hanoi. Um, but really, this is a private sector story. I mean, at, at some level, it's the private sector that decides where to, you know, invest and, you know, put their production bases and how to move goods and services around. And so um, I just wonder to what extent um, is the private sector bought into some of these initiatives um, in your own country or, you know, looking across um, this this issue, do you see that that the private sector is is, um, you know, looks at these issues in the same way and or and or do they need, you know, incentives from governments to to, uh, you know, pursue uh, business choices that align with with government interests, uh, you know, that have all been all of you have touched on uh, throughout your presentation. So Fukuoka san, like starting with the Japanese business sector, uh, are they bought into this story and, you know, are they do, moving in the ways that you're suggesting anyway, or are you incentivizing them in some way to, you know, to, to, to align with, with government policy uh, priorities? Thank you so much. Uh, it's a very, very good, uh, uh, good question, actually. Uh, as uh, Mashusa mentioned that uh, supply, supply chain is a uh, issue for the private sector. Uh, we uh, government cannot control or control fully uh, of the, for the uh, private sector. So we we have to we must uh, promote promote uh, private sector to make their supply chain resilience. So this uh, is not always in in directly in line with our policy actually. Uh, they they are uh, they 
private company has a stake in the business or profit. So, uh, and not not always think think about the uh, econ uh, economic security or so. So, uh, our idea is that uh, promoting a, is very important. So, so that's why uh, we involve uh, Jetro and invest in India and Australia. These are the uh, institute uh, of the organization to to promoting our agencies of the governments. And the second point is that we have to, we need to uh, make the uh, uh, some subsidy program uh, to to uh, to promote the private sector's action. So th these are uh, under these principles, supply chain principles is uh, also effective for to change change uh, Japanese companies uh, action based on the uh, uh, supply chain principle this if the pri private sectors are project is in line with their uh, our policy we will uh, give some our uh, uh, financing or uh, are uh, subsidies or these kind of uh, measures is necessary, I think, for or change for uh, to change the uh, companies. Thank you. Okay, uh, Druva, do you want to take a stab at that? The sort of private sector government nexus here. Uh, you know, I I think it is a bit of a challenge. Uh, you know, my sense is uh, uh, Japan and South Korea, for example, have a better uh, interface between the governments and private sectors. And you see, you know, uh, JICA and other you know organizations working much much more uh, much better with with Japanese industry on, on some of this. Uh, in India, uh, and my sense is similar in the United States. You know, we don't have as much of a, a strong tradition of governments and and private sector working uh, abroad uh, as, as closely together. Uh, and so I think some of this has been, it's been a bit of a steep learning curve for, for India, for example, uh, in terms of uh, investing, you know, uh, uh, trade trade facilitation, trade promotion, uh, interface with, with industry, uh, finding areas. Uh, you know, one area, it, it's still very early days yet in India, but one area of uh, uh, outward uh, lending, so state-backed lending through the Export-Import Bank of India. Um, it has seen uh, sort of a growth in, in recent years, particularly in South Asia and in Africa, a little bit in Southeast Asia, but not perhaps as much as it could be. Um, so, uh, so, uh, but, but I, I do think it's, it's a, a learning process um, and, and there are often frustrations and gaps between, uh, between the private sector, you know, uh, sometimes risk averseness. Um, I was on a committee for a while uh, of, uh, sort of looking at how Indian industry could improve its scale up in Southeast Asia. And one of the challenges we found was we had a lot of uh, Indian businesses that were actually quite successful um, in healthcare in Myanmar, in uh, ceramics in Indonesia. Just I mean, just to give some some random examples, and these Indian companies were, were knew the knew the local conditions, uh, employed locally, uh, but they were very reluctant to scale up because they just saw it as too risky um, and didn't see the, the market value. So I think uh, sometimes there is that that divide between the strategic intent. Uh, for all of us, you know, think tankers sitting in, in national capitals and actually uh, putting money where where our mouths are. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Vo. Do you want to offer thoughts on that question about the private sector's role in all of this? Yeah, um, I think uh, um, for the private company, they only focus on the profit. And here in Vietnam, we have a a, a big problem uh, with the um, with the private sector where they uh, often uh, import um, uh, most of materials from the other countries. For example, uh, we are quite close to China and we share uh, uh, a long border with China, which is uh, the least, least factory in the world and it is also the biggest market. So a lot of sector in Vietnam use uh, the raw materials uh, from, the, uh, from the China. And uh, for the government, the government uh, want to um, to improve the uh, domestic uh, uh, production capacity and um, want to encourage the, the, uh, the, the private sector to use uh, domestic materials. However, the, the, the materials produced in Vietnam uh, are quite expensive uh, compared to 
that are imported from China. And in this, this case, the government uh, already um, has um, uh, in, implemented a lot of policy like a tax incentive uh, to encourage the uh, private sector to uh, to use uh, domestic uh, materials. And, uh, and also we are like uh, the second factory of China. So um, there, there is a move of low value active production from China to Vietnam rather than the high uh, technology, uh, high uh, value active uh, productions. So in this case, uh, the, new, um, the, the new version of uh, the law on investment in Vietnam uh, uh, has just updated and uh, we already, um, as I mentioned before, we already identified some, um, some uh, priority sector, uh, for example, uh, high technology, uh, startup innovation, for example. So in, in this case, the government uh, throughout uh, the policy tried to, uh, to improve uh, uh, the domestic capacity of uh, production using uh, a lot of uh, solutions, including uh, tax incentives. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, Alex, do you want to take a stab at that? And, you know, you're on the ground working with U.S. business, so really interested in your perspective. Sure. Well, uh, I think private sector firms will obviously pursue their own interests. Uh, based on our experience here in Vietnam, I do think that the private sector is very much aligned with our overall goal of creating supply chains that are transparent, secure, and resilient. And the reason is because many of the problems that have emerged during the pandemic are really not something any one company can solve on their own, either as, as a company or even as an industry. Whether it's a factory shut down across the world in a foreign country that prevents you from getting critical inputs, or the skyrocketing, skyrocketing cost of ocean freight rates or ability to get space on a container vessel for your product. I mean, these are problems that very, very few businesses can solve on their own. You really need governments or, or a multi-stakeholder coalition to come together and solve them. And I, I mean, a good example here on the ground in Vietnam, during the height of the pandemic, you know, much of Southern Vietnam went into very strict lockdown. And, you know, we had quite a few dialogues that we co-organized here with provincial governments, with US government technical experts, with foreign and domestic companies on how can we work together to enable a safe reopening that you know protects the lives of workers, but also protects livelihoods and the economy. And it was that sort of you know, bringing together government business and public health experts that helped us get through some of this. So I do think uh, the private sector is actually you know, a strong partner in, in this effort. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, I got a lot more to say on that, but um, I, <clears throat> or to ask about on that, but let me move on to another um, issue. And I want to ask Dr. Vo and then maybe uh, Dhruva, your perspective from India, uh, on the Indian perspective on this. Um, Dr. Vo, you mentioned um, IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, which is the Biden administration's um, uh, offering of, a, of an economic um plan uh, for engagement in, in um, broadly defined Asia. Um, and, um, and one of those pillars uh, of that Indo-Pacific economic framework is supply chain resilience. Um, but as you mentioned, um, the US, at least for now, is not willing to offer Vietnam or any of the other participants in uh, IPEF uh, market access or increased market access to the United States market, which is the largest market in the world. And tr traditionally, the kind of the main incentive that the U.S. has offered in order to encourage countries to, um, you know, to um, make the policy reforms or adopt the high standards that the U.S. is seeking. So in do, do you think, you know, or I guess the way I'd put it is, how do you think Vietnam is looking at this initiative? What does it want from this initiative, particularly in supply chains? And will it will will the Vietnam feel incentivized you know, to engage fully in this initiative, particularly on supply chains, which we're talking about today, without that offer of market access? Is there something else that Vietnam wants from the United States? Dr. Rowe. Dr. Rowe, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you need to unmute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so um, you just mentioned about the the, um, the IPEF is a um, 
Of course, it is not. Um, it is uh, not. It is not um, uh, trading on agreement, but it's, it has four pillars of fair economy, connect economy, resilient economy, and clean economy. And I and and I, and I think that the IPEF um, uh, objective uh, is in line with the, uh, our um, objective as well. So uh, we uh, expect that uh, this framework will um, help us to have a, um, a higher level um, of exportation to uh, to to the to the US because uh, you know before we. Um, we have signed the, the T, uh, TBB and we, we want to have a, a U.S. in the uh, in the agreement, but uh, finally uh, U.S. Uh, didn't show the, the TBB. And now uh, the uh, IPEF is expected to uh, to be a, re a replacement of the uh, of the role of uh, the U.S. in um, Asian uh, countries, and uh, we consider it's uh, like a. A counter, uh, a counter factor uh, uh, for for China. So uh, that means uh, that uh, that means that we can uh, benefit uh, this uh, framework to um, to to strengthen uh, the U.S. and Vietnam relationship uh, as uh, trusted partners. So, but you, you see, uh, we trust uh, like John the uh, 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 the Indo-Pacific economic framework uh, for prosperity and. Um, it is just in money, so uh, we um, can't s uh, say uh, most things in advance about uh, the benefit of uh, um, that framework uh, to Vietnam at, uh, at the moment. But we expect to uh, to have a, um, more accepted to the, the U.S. in uh, in, in the future um, thanks to this framework. Okay, thank you. Um, Dhruva, you know, a lot of people were surprised when India joined um, IPEF, mm -hmm. at least the launch uh, event. Um, why did India join? What, what does it want from this uh, IPEF initiative um, and particularly in supply chains, but more broadly? Sure, yeah. No, I mean, I'd say so three things on IPEF. So one is, um, I think, so credit. I, I see a lot of people writing it off, and I think it's a bit premature uh, that it's not, doesn't have a lot of substance behind it. Um, I think sort of credit to the Biden administration on the political side, uh, which is just bringing in this group of very diverse group of countries together, uh, six ASEAN countries, Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji now join and India um, is, is no mean feat. And so I think, you know, they deserve a lot of credit on the political side. And I think, again, the devil will now be in the detail in the next two years in terms of actual negotiations towards concrete outcomes. Um, so I think you know it would be uh, you know 2024 would be a good time to assess IPEF and 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 uh, what it's been able to accomplish. Uh, I think anything short of that is premature. The second point I'd make is you know at least three of the four pillars uh, actually align very uh, closely with India's broader objectives, which is uh, supply chain resilience, um, particularly with, with sort of friendly countries. Um, second is the sort of greening, uh, sustainable development uh, objectives and, and uh, sort of green economy. And the third is the anti-corruption side of things. Uh, you know, uh, tax havens has been a very high, a big issue for India. So on three of the four pillars, actually, I think, you know, there's this broad based alignment between the U.S. and India uh, on these issues. And if there are any differences that emerge, it'll really be over sort of some minor details. Um, um, the fourth uh, pillar is actually, I think, a bit of the challenging one, which is trade and digital. And both of those have the, the digital side has its own set of challenges. India doesn't uh, have the same set of priorities uh, as the United States, um, but lumping them in together could be potentially problematic. So that that's the part I would hold my breath on a little bit. Um, I think there's also a realistic assessment on um, uh, that that the U.S. is not uh, going to give much or anything in the way of market access. Um, and, and lower tariffs. And it's for two reasons. I think one is, and, and this is often overlooked, which is the U.S. just generally has much lower tariffs than any other major economy in the world, right? So average weighted tariffs uh, of, uh, under MFN uh, for the U.S. is about, I think, 3.5%. The EU is about, on average about 5.5%. China is 7.5%. So the U.S. is already a much more open economy and it's hard to get to zero, uh, you know. Uh, so I, I think that we, we do have to look at that standard or that baseline. The second element is, I think, just the political reality, which is, you know, you you talk to there isn't 
uh, a political appetite at this point for uh, TPA in the U.S. Congress, both uh, and, and their hesitations both on the Republican side and the and the Dem and the uh, Democrat side. So uh, I think re quite realistically, in the next couple of years, uh, there there's a, a close to zero chance of uh, a, a major traditional trade agreement. And I, I think the Biden administration knows this. The USTR has, has spoken about this. So, so with that in mind, I, I think sort of expectations on the on the trade front must be kept low. Um, I, realistically, we could have uh, some of the standards from TPP transposed upon IPF, and uh, you know, I know what realistic is: one quarter, one third, one fifty percent of the, the 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 standards element from uh, from from CPTPP uh, being transposed into IPF. Um, but I do anticipate some uh, uh, quite a bit of back and forth on the digital and trade side between India and the U.S. So actually, that that if I can follow up with you, um, because it was interesting that you you know put the trade pillar in a different category, and there's been a question here from the audience that's sort of related to this, which is you know that there are many challenges doing business in India and regulatory uncertainty and so forth. Um, but you also said that India is desiring to, you know, more integrate into into global supply chains, and and it has at least an, um, initiated or or revived or or in, been willing shown willingness to engage in a number of different trade initiatives, if if not so much yet with the U.S., you know, with Europe, with others. And so, you know, the question is, is is this potentially an opportunity for? Um, the Modi administration to use this sort of engagement in a different way that they have traditionally, you mentioned the development model in India has been different, you know, to use um, this trade engagement um, to, to, to promote domestic economic reform in a way that, you know, has been used in other countries um, as a form of, um, you know, the Japanese call it, have a word for it, gaiatsu, <laughs> external pressure to help promote domestic reform. Is that what you think that Modi is either deliberately or unintentionally um, doing here? Um, I, I, I won't put, uh, so, you know, there's some uh, some reforms which might make India more competitive. And I think that uh, part of the the rethought through trade, uh, appro Indian approach to trade is, is really about that, which is uh, RCEP, which India withdrew from, uh, largely because of the inclusion of China in the Regional Conference of Economic Partnership, um, would have made India less competitive. And that was the broad assessment, at least uh, under the terms that were on offer. Um, whereas some of the trade agreements being negotiated now uh, are, are with uh, with um, uh, economies that are deemed more complementary, where India's, uh, India doesn't worry about dumping as much, or at least it can put in provisions that prevent dumping. Um, and that makes Indian industry more more competitive. And so these are largely more consumer-based economies, or you know, Australia, EU, Canada, uh, the U.S. I think the concern is just that the appetite is there for a traditional trade agreement at this point of time. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think just the, the the sort of Gordian knot that you're going to have to resolve on the U.S.-India trade front is India has trade deficits with almost every major economy in in, in the world except the United States. And so, you know, particularly under a Republican administration, even a Republican Congress, that's something that they will look at and they say, you know, for, for the Trump administration, India was on there, uh, it was top 10 in terms of countries with which uh, the U.S. had a trade deficit. And so it was the focus of uh, sanctions. And India said, well, you know, we, we have trade deficits with everybody else except for the United States. Uh, so why are you so hard on us? So I, I think that this is just uh, one of those issues, two consumer driven economies, services driven economies. Are going to have this sort of uh, if, if both are trying to simultaneously boost their manufacturing base, uh, will will butt heads on on that issue. Okay, helpful. Um, so we have a, a question which I was going to get to also about the quad, the quadrennial, uh, sorry, the quadrilateral security um, initiative, or popularly known as the quad, bringing the U.S., India. Uh, Japan and Australia together, and you know whether there's an opportunity for countries, other countries in the region um, like Vietnam, um, to to you know engage with the Quad. Let me extend that question because I was going to ask more about the Quad itself and its working on its work on supply chains, which is relatively new. And actually, I'm going to start with Fukuoka San so you can think about how to answer this. You know, the initiative you mentioned, the Supply Chain Resilience Initiative, pointedly doesn't have the United States in it. And so I'm just interested in, was that a outside the quad sort of initiative? You know, what is the quad doing um, in this area that is useful and significant? And then I guess for everybody to think about, um, 
a broader question about all these different initiatives, whether it's in the Quad or in IPEF or in um, bilateral engagements or in other other um, other initiatives where we're talking about supply chains. There's a whole uh, you know bevy of different different things going on. Uh, is there a risk here of you know that these things are going to be in conflict with each other in one way or another? Uh, that you know either we're going to be just doing things that are that are zero sum in some way um, or that uh, or that we create over capacity because everybody's decided they're going to make their supply chains more resilient and are going to promote more uh, you know production investment at home of critical things and then we get a, a global surplus there's a lot in that question but I'm deliberately doing that because we don't have a huge amount of time and I want to let all of our speakers take any of that in any direction they would like to go but um, I'm just worried about this sort of coordination problem that you've got all these different strands of work and that that's going to be hard to hard to coordinate, but let me start with the Quad and Fukuoka-san, um, your thoughts on that. Thank you for your uh, good question. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, supply chains are interconnected and uh, close countries, and uh, the resilience is essential for all our country. So on the, in the Japanese companies accumulated a uh, huge manufacturing, manufacturing base in the uh, Asia region, uh, including ASEAN, uh, India, and uh, China also. And uh, Kua uh, uh, is very important for all us because that uh, uh, India has a, a promising uh, manufacturing base. And uh, they has uh, they they have the uh, future economic uh, potential, and uh, Australia has a uh, some in uh, st strong in the has the strongest in the uh, logistics and uh, capacity capacity building. This kind of the uh, collaboration uh, is very important. And uh, our lessons from the uh, past is that the uh, concentr concentration on the uh, of the uh, manufacturing base is very very uh, has a risk uh, for the supply chain resilience. So uh, inter uh, international uh, collaboration is very important. I think so. I I, will, I comment. Uh, I will make a comment briefly. Okay, thank you. thank you. That's helpful. Dr. Bo, I mean, do, do you have thoughts about um, does does Vietnam want to engage with the Quad? Is that helpful? Is it uh, particularly again on supply chains um, or is do you see any 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 inconsistency or or problem created by, um, you know, different work streams here um, in different combinations of countries? Um, thoughts on that would be helpful. Uh, but I think uh, uh, recently, um, with the with the quad, there may be a uh, uh, global supply chain shift uh, to the other countries into uh, three uh, directions. The first that is a supply chain shift to countries in the same in the same geographical area to reduce dependence or avoid risk from trade wars or mutual tensions between uh, economies and. Uh, the city often uh, come to countries like Vietnam, and it is quite um, quite risky for Vietnam because uh, the uh, the movement um, of um, uh, investment flow uh, is for the low value added uh, low added value uh, production to uh, to Vietnam. So they only want to spread risk and optimize uh, production costs. And in this case. Um, that uh, uh, may cause uh, uh, risk for uh, uh, country, developing country like Vietnam. And uh, the ind industries and fields that are moving in this direction include textile manufacturing of simple components and spare parts. And uh, the, the, the second direction of the shift uh, uh, of, the, the shift of uh, supply chain uh, required investment often associated with high tech uh, production activities and uh, they, uh, the production in that kind of uh, supply chain shift um, are uh, uh, associated with the high added value productions related to technology, security and national security. And in this case, of course, 
this shifting will uh, make a little the enterprise moving on or a part of their production to the home countries. In, the, in, the, in this case, uh, the, the country like Vietnam, like Vietnam, we don't have much benefit from that shift. And uh, the, the, the last one is that the restructuring and rearranging a supply chain to uh, diversify, diversifying supply sources, uh, expanding uh, the network of suppliers to spread risk. Uh, subject uh, ordering raw materials components uh, from many suppliers in different countries. And I think Vietnam can benefit a bit uh, from this uh, shift. And um, for Vietnam, in order to um, benefit from the quad, we need to, as I mentioned before, we need to improve our infrastructure so that we can meet the requirement of the investor from for, uh, foreign uh, from quad. And uh, second, we also need to, um, uh, to ease uh, in, uh, investment flows uh, by our law on investment. Of course, we just update our law, but uh, to, uh, from the paper to the real, uh, real life, uh, um, the, the, the real world, you see that it's always uh, again. And, uh, and, uh, and also um, the, the, the level of um, uh, labor skill in Vietnam need to improve uh, significantly to meet the, the requirements of uh, high technology production. In this case, we can benefit uh, the, uh, from the, the, the supply chain uh, resilience of the advanced economies uh, um, or the, the other countries, uh, for example, from the, the Quad. Okay, thank you. You touched on something um, in passing that uh, several of the speakers alluded to, which is this infrastructure constraint, and and just uh, that was another area I would have liked to have explored. Uh, we are um, very interested in this um, uh, global infrastructure story and have done a lot of work on that and are interested in how this new partnership for global uh, infrastructure and investment that the G7 announced is going to um, impact this story. But we don't have time for that. We'll have to do a separate event on that at some point. Let me ask... Um, uh, maybe uh, Druva and then Alex to uh, to comment on any of this, the quad or or the broader coordination question that I asked. Um, you know, and then we'll we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. But go ahead, Druva. Uh, I mean, on the quad, I think you know you have right now a sort of series of working groups in about ten to twelve areas, um, and I think again one of the good things about it is rather than sort of open ended. Uh, talk shops in each of these areas now. They've the in the four countries have identified specific concrete objectives that they that they can be met. The other thing that's been sort of uh, uh, helpful is that the Quad has been uh, flexible about working with partners, and you've seen sort of ad hoc uh, partner, you know, uh, working with uh, Singapore, working with. Uh, South Korea and on some of the security stuff, but um, that doesn't basically it, it doesn't inhibit the, aspect, the the possibility of cooperating with third countries. One of the challenges has really been, um, I mean, I don't know how much this applies to Vietnam per se, but uh, broadly, uh, sort of the uh, ASEAN concerns about the somehow eroding ASEAN centrality and 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 unity. Uh, has actually deterred some of the uh, sort of uh, potential collaboration with ASEAN member states on some of these issues. Uh, and then there are also questions of sort of scale and, and uh, you know, I, I, I do think, for example, personally, that, that the Quad should be doing a lot more in terms of reaching out to Indonesia, uh, particularly just given the, 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 the size of uh, its growing population and, and, and growing economy. But, um, uh, but, but again, the, the, there's a lot more that can be done there. So uh, I, I think there's an opportunity, but a lot of it, 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 it will depend not just on the four Quad countries, but also on, on ASEAN member states and, and how much, how comfortable they are in, in working with them on on certain specific issues, and I think that there's certainly a lot of uh, non-controversial uh, issues that I, I, I think uh, are, are ripe for uh, exploration. Right. Okay. Well, you mentioned Indonesia. We did also talk a little about that in our report a couple months ago, and and um, you know uh, suggest uh, that we should have a separate conversation about that sometime. Very important economy and country, as you say. Um, Alex, you get the final word. I know you're focused more specifically on issues there in Ho Chi Minh City, but I wonder if you have thoughts on these broader questions. Go ahead. Sure. I think in terms of whether there are too many overlapping efforts. I mean, my view is these are really multifaceted challenges, so I think it's only natural that we address them in a variety of fora with a wide range of partners, whether that's through 
bilateral dialogues or multilateral ones like the Quad or IPEF. And just, just to make one quick point on IPEF, um, sort of dovetailing with something Druva said earlier, you know, a lot is a lot's been made about the lack of market access in IPEF, but I think it's important to note that in most cases, U.S. markets are already more open or far more open to exports from our IPEF partner countries than their markets are to ours. And when you look at the surge of Vietnamese exports to the United States over the past several years, it's really hard to argue in my mind, at least that U.S. tariffs pose a barrier to Vietnamese exports. So, um, you know, we, we do think Vietnam is a really valuable partner in IPEF, and we do see a lot of synergies, particularly as as relates to supply chain resilience and clean energy. So we think, um, you know, these are really difficult topics, and uh, we hope that by coming together, we can help solve them as a, as a group. Okay, well, terrific. Well, there's another uh, topic, IPEF, that we, we need to do, well, we will do <laughs> more uh, events like this on. Uh, it's it's um, obviously got a rich agenda. A lot of the issues that, that uh, we touched on here are covered there. So uh, stay tuned on all of that. But um, this has been a terrific conversation. I, I do think, you know, this story of supply chain resilience is is very important and it's um, it's it's important for governments to be uh, focused on on trying to get that balance between resilience and efficiency right i will say you know there's going to be a cost in in moving from efficiency to resilience um, that um, you know has a number of dimensions which it's i don't have enough time to spell through but i do think we have to be thinking through uh, that question of cost um, as as we look at this and there's some risks as well as i mentioned in passing uh, that we're going to have a subsidy race that creates overcapacity and inefficiency um, in that way. I'm also worried a little about protectionism that countries will use some of these efforts to try to, you know, protect um, their own markets rather than, you know, promote, you know, kind of broader uh, global economic uh, good. Um, so I, I don't mean to end on a negative note, but I do think there's a lot uh, here to unpack and to consider um, as we look at this story of supply chain resilience and. Um, you know, I think that we this will all be uh, something that we and others uh, in Washington and, and I presume in the other capitals represented here will um, will also be uh, will be exploring. And we look forward to continuing the conversation uh, for now. Let me thank our tremendous um, group of experts uh, for your really thoughtful insights, very clear, concise and um, and uh, great food for thought as we continue our uh, thinking and work in this area. So so thank you all for your time and insights. And thank you to our audience for listening and for your questions. And um, stay tuned for, for more, uh, more um, conversations like this uh, from CSIS Economics. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.